Uh, I'm assistant professor and extension specialist in soil and nutrient management at the University of Nebraska. And I'm a center, I'm stationed out at Panhandle Center in Scottsbluff. And I would like to acknowledge my co-author here, Saurabh Das. He's my research buddy. He's a soil health postdoc research associate in my team. So today I want to uh, share about a soil health, interactive soil health reference map for the state of Nebraska. Uh, now I'm realizing this, this is gonna be a very monumental effort in collaboration with the uh, USDA and RCS, particularly Aaron and Carlos uh, Villarreal. Um, so the key word here is reference. So as we learn to measure and manage anything, uh, we want a reference point to compare and contrast against. And same is true for soil health. As we are learning soil health management, uh, it would be good to have a reference point and that's gonna be our effort. So before I tell you about the project, which we are initiating this year, uh, how we got to this uh, line of thought, so certainly as somebody said very wisely, yes, unless we can measure it, uh, how can we manage it? So soil health, a lot of work is going towards soil health indicators, identifying some key indicators, right? There are scores of indicators, but what are those uh, magical few indicators that will give us a real status of soil health in a crop plant? So a lot of efforts are going on in that direction. And recently I learned about this very interesting uh, work by Alan Franz Lubers. He's uh, with, uh, in, at Relay, uh, USDA ARS. Uh, Alan uh, apparently is a Nebraska native and he did a good, very nice presentation at our department. You can access these and other seminar presentations at our department and Department of Ag and Horde web page. Uh, all the presentations are uh, up there. Actually, I took a screenshot shot from uh, his presentation where he talks about soil test biological activity, which is actually a flush of CO2. It's soil respiration uh, data. Uh, he thinks he presented this being a very, very critical indicator among all the available soil health indicators. And his research connected uh, this flush of CO2 measurement with at least a couple of soil health functions, uh, crop production and nutrient cycling, primarily the nitrogen. Uh, so what is soil test biological activity? It's pretty much soil respiration. Uh, so when you do the soil respiration measurement in your lab by reweighting the soil, flush, first you get that flush of CO2, which we call uh, CO2 burst. And then uh, after over time, uh, it gets kind of uh, leveled off, basal soil respiration. Uh, but however you compare uh, the relative differences of type of soils or the depth of the soil sample you collected, it stays pretty similar no matter uh, which uh, slope you measure for your carbon mineralization. So uh, this gentleman, he took the CO2 flush in three-day uh, respiration test, and he had a very wonderful data set where he could relate, uh, correlate that data set all across different land uses, different soil types. Uh, this measure was very well correlated with uh, nutrient mineralization, nitrogen availability in the soil, uptake by the crops, some biological indicators as well. So my point here is a lot of efforts are going on uh, and this is very important to identify some key indicators. We, we are not gonna tell our producers, right? You go and do 20 different measurements. No, we have to identify a uh, few key indicators that would give a good soil health status for our soil. And besides that, a lot of research is going on towards determining how different management practices can improve or affect uh, soil health. You know, 
uh, in terms of several indicators or uh, some specific soil health indicators. So my point here that I'm going to discuss today is about the benchmarking. Don't we know also need to know uh, not only the direction where I'm going, but how long, how far I'm going to stretch myself in terms of managing the soil to improve the health of it. Um, you might have seen a figure like this uh, for a different soil test, right? Let's say soil test uh, for nitrogen. Uh, in early 80s, a lot of soil test uh, experiment were done to come up to this stage where now today, if you are given a soil value for let's say nitrogen or phosphorus, uh, you know the range uh, when it is low or very low and accordingly, correspondingly, we know when any input would be, uh, would affect your output. So just a thought, don't you think we would also need something like this benchmark someday down the road once we learn how to measure uh, soil health uh, we will come to a point where we'll have to decide what is the what is the uh, threshold uh, what are the threshold values uh, beyond which some of my management intervention intervention will affect the soil health. Similarly, critical values, right? If I do not uh, do good stewardship, what is that critical point beyond which, you know, my soil health will deteriorate, deteriorate maybe irreversibly. So these are some of the thought uh, I had, like we need some kind of benchmarking. But today, the benchmarking system I'm talking about is uh, what we call soil health gap. And it's very intuitive, very easy to understand, I would say. Uh, we have a native soil. Native soil has its own inherent properties uh, specific to the area, specific to the uh, climate, uh, topography, uh, all, all those uh, parameters. Now, since we started cultivation, since we broke the sods, started growing crops, uh, over the years, it's very, um, I would say, okay to assume that as this land is feeding the world in this due course of feeding the population, it has lost some of its health, right? And depending the climate conditions, depending how we manage the land, uh, that that loss in health uh, might vary. Um, so whatever difference that we see today in our managed farmland compared to the original native land, that's what I'm calling soil health gap. And this uh, idea is very similar to uh, yield gap concept. Uh, in this figure, you can see there are three different bars, potential, attainable, and actual. So the current actual yield a farmer is reaping from his ground is on the right hand, which is the smallest bar. And given everything is favorable, the climate does good for him. Uh, he, he manages the uh, crop production the best he can. He has all the necessary nutrients available for the crops, then that potential uh, yield is much, much larger than what its actual yield is. Now, by improving the management, how close we, how, how, how much we can close that gap between um, potential and actual uh, yield may vary. So the attainable uh, gap maybe something in between actual and potential yield. So it's the same uh, understanding concept we, we are overlaying on top of soil health. So soil health gap, it's difference between soil health status of, of uh, undisturbed native soil and the uh, soil health in the cropland. And we are still figuring out which indicator we will uh, um, 
focus on, depending on that, uh, Sol health gap will be just this simple mathematical equation. Gap equals to uh, Sol health single property or the, the function of several properties measured in the native minus cropland. Uh, to simplify the understanding, let's say I'm looking at organic matter, right? Like Jay also showed how organic matter is something we all very easily understand and believe is key to soil health. So the gap with respect to organic carbon would be carbon that you see in the native soil minus carbon in your uh, current cropland. So this is the soil health gap. Uh, just to verify this concept, we did some uh, very simple soil sampling in Scottsbluff County. Uh, all the soils here are more like a sandy loam, a very fine sandy loam. We collected top eating soils from four different locations. First one, native uh, uh, prairie, uh, then no-till farmland. Uh, this no-till farmland has been under no-tillers for about 17 years, where we grow varieties of cropping systems. Conventionally till also has a rotation, dry bean, corn, sugar beet, but has been under tillers for a uh, good 20 years. And we also found a land which has a subsoil exposed. You know, we have rolling hills here. So farmers sometimes like to level off this farm just for the ease of management. So thereby exposes the subsoil. So subsoil, and we did a, just one measurement organic carbon, and probably this is pretty evident. Uh, No-till had little higher, a little over 2% uh, organic carbon. Uh, conventional had lower and exposed subsoil soil has about 0.7% organic carbon. And there's something, nothing new, right? We know that no-till on the topsoil would have a higher ca carbon, but when we uh, add this fourth column, which is grassland, then this gives us a much more perspective uh, that can inform our management practices. So grassland in Scottsbluff, dryland, right, semi-arid uh, climate condition, had an organic matter of over 4%. So what we think uh, with this kind of data set, this kind of reference point, what we get to see is that instead of comparing my no-till against conventional till or other type of management practices, now I can compare my no-till against the grassland where we never uh, went in and till ever. And we see the gap of about 2%. So what this tells me is that now I get some realistic target if I want to improve my cropland, uh, in addition to no-till, if I want to do cover crop or integrated system, add some more organic, uh, then now I know how far I can shoot for. So in absence of this kind of comparison, some may overestimate, overclaim, or some may underestimate the soil health management. So this kind of reference point would allow us to set a realistic goal when it comes to soil health management. This is another data set, Sky Wills at NRCS. She has a multi-state uh, project going on where they are also comparing uh, cropland against um, uh, prairies. And here is a data set for some biological indicator, uh, PLFA and perennial has higher count of PLFA compared to, and then uh, in a successive manner, then no-till has second highest most and till has less. So again, bringing back the yield gap uh, concept here. So ecologically, if we haven't, if we have left the ground untouched, in terms of this particular uh, soil health indicator, ecologically, that's the potential line. And this is 
the actual soil health status in terms of PLFA. Now this gives us a target, the ceiling, how high I can jump up to. And with proper management over years, probably somewhere between high ceiling of ecological potential and the floor of our actual status, somewhere in between would be my attainable soil health goal. So the gap concept has challenges. Um, uh, it would be hard um, to find a reference site for every cropland nearby, right? Now you take a Google map everywhere, it's circle. Uh, we can see everywhere it's a cropland. So one thing will be to uh, be challenging is to find the reference site. Um, in some cases, uh, let's say in a very, very arid region, if you have started uh, watering and growing crops properly, might be there might be actually a gain in soil health in the cropland. Uh, so there are some uh, nuances there. But still, I do see soil health gap concept can really set a realistic goal, will allow us to scout our own farm or farms and identify which soil part is more sick and thereby allows me to very strategically uh, apply soil health management uh, practices in order to build up the soil. So this is how we got to this uh, reference map uh, collaboration with uh, Aaron and Carlos at the NRCS. What we are trying to do is, this is gonna be a very monumental work where we are going to identify enough reference sites for the state, go do sampling and document the soil health status. So we are going to first find the benchmark soils that uh, corresponds to majority of the cropland soil in the state. Uh, and in those benchmark soils, we'll try to find uh, unmanaged land mass or properly managed range land and take them as a reference sites, measure the different soil health parameters, put them in a one, uh, data platform and make it available for any producer to go into that map, find nearest reference sites for their cropland and compare their cropland soil health against that reference site, thereby inform themselves how much uh, I have lost my health in the soil and how high I can aim when it comes to soil health management. So where we are right now, of course, when you look down on the state, this is what we see, a lot of cropland, very hard to find the reference sites. Um, and we are using this land source hierarchy from N NRCS. Uh, MLRA is the uh, pretty high up, higher up hierarchy uh, soil units, which uh, accounts for inherent soil properties, uh, climate in the region, uh, different land uses. And then we are also using the uh, another unit, which is ecological sites, which are, which are recently developed, which goes uh, even more specific, specific to the native plant communities. Uh, if you can locate the areas uh, where uh, you can cross check with the references for the native plant communities, uh, we hope to identify uh, the sites which is unmanaged and can be our uh, reference sites for soil health. So what we're gonna do is, this is the MLRA map for Nebraska. We are gonna go into each MLRA, look for the benchmark soils, identify number of benchmark soils which corresponds to majority of the crop plan and then find within those units uh, the range land which is unmanaged or properly managed so that the native vegetations are intact. So those will be our reference sites. I don't know, we haven't done the math, maybe we would 
eventually need hundreds of such sites to really populate the map uh, enough for every uh, end users to use it uh, in a meaningful way. So we are right now at that point where we are identifying the locations uh, in under each MLREs. We're gonna then, with the help of our NRCS colleagues, we are gonna scout those points, identify, and then start uh, soil health measurement this spring. And these are some of the list of uh, uh, physical parameters we're gonna measure at each locations. Uh, I see that what's missing here is uh, infiltration. Instead of doing double ring infilt infiltration, we are going to do saturate hydraulic conductivity measurement. Uh, then these are the list of chemical parameters. Um, this is also a little old. Uh, we added here uh, epoxy also, uh, permanganate oxidizable carbon measurement as well, and uh, some biological measurements. So these are all uh, sets of data for each reference sites will be available in eventual interactive map where any end user can go in, locate nearest reference sites and compare their managed land against the reference sites to determine how much soil has strayed off in his cropland from the native and how high I can target my, for my soil health management. Mm -hmm. So for example, uh, let's say we got a native land, maybe it's a tree line, and just for simplicity, just one indicator, organic matter comes out to be 3.6%. And then we have here two, two brothers, Smith and Daniel. Uh, they manage their soils in the same ecological system uh, where the reference site is, similar soil type, uh, but they manage the crop uh, cropping systems differently. Uh, Smith has diversity in the crop, no-till, Daniel monocropping, corn price is going up. He's happy with corn after corn is growing corn. So when you measure the organic matter in those two systems, let's say it comes out to be 2.5 in Smith's farm and 1.2 in Daniel's. Now, instead of comparing against each other, now they compare themselves against uh, tree lines and the soil health gap is 1.1% for Smith and 2.4 for Daniel. And now Daniel and Smith, they are good friends, good neighbors. So he asks, oh, what do you do, right? That your organic matter is twice of mine. We are in the same soil system, agroecological systems. And then he, as a good neighbor, learns from Smith, starts doing no-till, diversity, and tries to raise his organic matter. And for Smith, he has to get a little more uh, creative. He plants something else, cover crop, manure, to uh, reach as close as possible to uh, native uh, 3.6 organic matter. So I felt like this kind of reference sites allows us to compare ourselves instead of against neighbor, against the actual reference point. And this also brings up another important point and which is carbon market. As carbon market is growing, Daniel has a higher potential to show uh, the gain in carbon, right? Because his soil has the low carbon, uh, low organic matter. So he has more potential for gain. But what about Smith, who has been doing great work all these years? Therefore, uh, he already has made of his organic matter to 2.5, and probably the gain he can show will be minimal. So, uh, gap concept will allow carbon marketers to acknowledge the better stewardship Smith has shown over the years uh, compared to Daniel who jumped into the wagon after the incentivized carbon market showed up. So uh, there's a lot of good stuff I think a gap concept can build up and we are working towards building that benchmark map. Uh, let's see how we do that. But I would like to end my presentation with a, 
first and foremost, my acknowledgement to NRCS for providing the very important resource funding to initiate this work. And of course, a lot of other friends who are part of this project. So with that, I'm gonna stop sharing and would be glad to take questions if you have any. Um, and I'll also run the Any question for me?